19 September 2001, just eight days after 9-11, military preparations begin for the first battle in the global war on terrorism. The enemy? Al-Qaeda terrorist cells, protected by Afghanistan's formidable terrain, harsh weather, and Taliban government. In an isolated country with no easy port of supply, it's a real challenge for us from the very beginning. As you can imagine, Afghanistan being a landlocked country, um, and maybe more importantly, locked by countries with which we had no ongoing agreements for access. Operation Enduring Freedom presents a complex web of challenges. Stop Al-Qaeda without further destabilizing a volatile region. Avoid the quagmire of a war of attrition and do it fast. It is a tall order and the first significant test of the 21st century military. In late September, political, diplomatic, military, and intelligence agencies make final preparations for U.S. forces to deploy in the air and on the ground. They build bonds with Northern Alliance leader Fahim Khan and other veteran Afghan commanders, including General Abdul Rashid Dostum. Through years of neglect, these are the men who fought the Taliban and survived. But now, as American allies, they are an unknown quantity. The agency had developed relationships with some of these leaders in the counter-terrorist uh, operation early because of, of Osama bin Laden's presence in the country. And so we had to really, we had to learn to rely on their relationships with these folks in order to then facilitate our military operations. 6 October 2001, Karshi Khanabad, Uzbekistan. The 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment arrives. It will provide lift for Task Force Dagger and much more. 7 October 2001, the air campaign begins. At the Prince Sultan Air Base outside of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, a combined air operations center gears up to manage all Allied military aircraft engaged in Afghanistan. The CAOC will coordinate diverse aircraft from all services on extended missions that will need repeated aerial refuelings en route and on the job in Afghanistan. Fighters from aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean, bombers from Diego Garcia, and other aircraft from bases in the Persian Gulf rapidly achieve air superiority and destroy the limited military infrastructure of the Taliban. In response, Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters merge with the Afghan population or move into underground caves and tunnel complexes, frustrating the U.S. ability to destroy them from the air. 17 October 2001, the 160th prepares to infiltrate two Special Forces A-teams to join with Northern Alliance fighters and coordinate their attacks. Each team is a regionally oriented multilingual unit consisting of 12 highly skilled soldiers who are cross-trained and extremely adaptable. The first team, ODA 555, Triple Nickel, is to link up with General Fahim Khan immediately in the Northeast. The second team, ODA 595, call sign Tiger 2, is to be inserted the next day behind the lines to support General Dostum south of Mazari Sharif. That night, a crew from the 160th Spirits ODA 555 toward Afghanistan. But as they cross the border, severe weather and near zero visibility leave them solely dependent on a grueling instrument technique, terrain following. Your entire world shrinks into a, about the size of a 50 cent piece. That's your entire life. Uh, and you're just staring at this thing, making adjustments for the aircraft. Very fatiguing operation. But severe weather conditions force them to abort their mission. On the 18th, the same problem. On 19 October, the weather forecast hasn't improved, but the commander weighs the risks and launches both teams. They leave Uzbekistan, refuel in the air, cross Tajikistan, and finally enter Afghan airspace. That's where the problems begin. As soon as we crossed the border into Afghanistan, we encountered a surprise sandstorm and heavy fog which created near zero visibility flight conditions. And their mission commander leaning forward made the call and they sent the escort aircraft back to Karshi Khanabad. 
At 0200 hours, the unarmed MH-47 drops ODA-595 at LZ Albatross. Through the night, Tiger II waits for General Dostum. He is known as a brutal warlord who has made and broken alliances with many factions. What will the morning bring? The answer comes in a burst of hoofbeats. First, about 20 horsemen came galloping up, their arm to the teeth, uh, looking pretty rough. You know, the heavy beards, your typical Soviet small arms to what they possessed, uh, light machine guns, AK-47s, RPGs, and they, and about 10 minutes behind them, uh, another 30 horsemen arrived with General Dostum. To their relief, they receive a warm welcome and follow the horsemen to Dostum's headquarters, a four-hour ride deep into the mountains. Only one member of ODA 595 is an experienced rider. It was an incredible, I mean, we were going up stuff that, you know, a foot wide, you know, you're a thousand feet up on a cliff that you knew if you fell, you were dead. This was our first chapter in the wild, wild west events that we would participate in every day. General Dostum, with Generals Mohammed Atta and Haji Mohammed Mohekik, lead about 5,000 lightly armed horse cavalry. Their opponents number around 10,000 with armor and artillery in prepared defensive positions. At Dostum's headquarters, ODA 595 and Dostum's forces size each other up. The special forces watch Dostum's 19th century horse cavalry in amazement. The Northern Alliance fighters are equally amazed when the special forces call in close airstrikes in the Chapchal area, about 10 kilometers away. It was really interesting for me um, during this operation. There, uh, the aerial bombardment of the United States forces was very impressive, and uh, there was uh, they no civilian were hurt, and their target was very accurate, and they were hitting the only the enemies. The special forces provide much-needed supplies to the Northern Alliance and demonstrate delivery of precision fires from strike aircraft. General Dostum briefs the Tiger II team commander on his plan of attack. It proves sound, and in the coming days, they invent new tactics for their unusual combined arms unit. 24 October 2001, Chopchal, Afghanistan. The horse cavalry and close air support test the novel tactics on the battlefield. The ground troops force the enemy to maintain defensive positions. The special forces then identify targets and call in precision munitions, exerting constant pressure to shape the battlefield. In the coming days, the coalition refines their innovative tactics and procedures. The special operations cells look for ways to speed up coordination and response times from the air, while in the KAOC and AWACS, air controllers step in to push strike aircraft toward those cells reporting targets. Gradually, pilots gain confidence in the ground controllers, the technology, and the rules of engagement. It was sort of a paradigm shift uh, for these folks. Uh, once the, there was a demonstrated success with the ROE, I think that then uh, that trust was further uh, deepened between the players in the air and uh, the players on the ground. The coordination reaches an unprecedented level as they talk directly with the KAOC and AWACS on a shared network the modern equivalent of a party line. I think that's the most important thing is the communication and the, and the coordination between all the different parts and pieces that are out there. To hear a kid who's struggling on the ground, he's got somebody shooting at him, he's got obstacles in his way, and I can take those obstacles out for him. It's, it is the most satisfying, the most gratifying uh, point of emission. 28 October. The task force commander at Karshi Khanabad augments Tiger II with two highly trained Air Force controllers and their equipment. Tiger II divides into four three-man teams and a command and control element. 31 October, the campaign continues northwest toward the Taliban's key defenses in the Darya Suf, the Valley of the Caves. 5 November, Baluch, Afghanistan. Each of the four Tiger teams is positioned at a strategic location with a major Northern Alliance commander. This will be the critical battle of the campaign. During the morning, Tiger II Bravo and Charlie have priority air support and use it to pound Taliban defenses. In the north,
Tiger II Charlie's priority is protecting the Alliance's northern flank, but by 1330, the team members find themselves in a fight for their lives. The Taliban is within 1,000 meters and closing. To the south, Tiger II Delta targets what is rumored to be the bunker of Mullah Razak, the commander of Taliban forces in the area. At 1400, the Taliban are about to surround Tiger II Charlie. Commander Ahmed Khan's cavalry opens a corridor for Charlie to escape. They call in JDAM's Danger Close to cover their withdrawal and an F-14 to strafe the pursuing Taliban. Atop a nearby mountain to the west, the most remote cell, Tiger II Alpha, faces an unexpected obstacle. An enemy command bunker prevents the team from linking up with General Dostum's main forces but they need precise coordinates to bomb the bunker without endangering a local village. A nearby predator diverts to help. The predator transmits real-time video of the bunker to the Kayak, where analysts determine precise target coordinates. But in the time it takes to do that, Tiger II Alpha's air support is retasked to a team already in contact with the enemy. At 1630, General Dostum receives word that Mullah Razak was indeed killed in the earlier strike. Dostum prepares to attack the bunker complex. Tiger II Bravo coordinates with a flight of F-18s to strike four targets in succession. Bombs in the air, they order a cavalry charge. And then out of nowhere, uh, precision-guided bombs began to land on Taliban and Al-Qaeda positions. The explosions were deafening, and the timing so precise that, as the soldiers described it, hundreds of Afghan horsemen literally came riding out of the smoke, coming down on the enemy in clouds of dusk and flying shrapnel. That day on the plains of Afghanistan, the 19th century met the 21st century, and they defeated a dangerous and determined adversary, a remarkable achievement. The whole success of this, or the integration of the air power, with the exception of the first few days, would have been useless without the Ford Air Controllers and the Special Operations Forces. I thought they did the most incredible job of this entire war. November 5th was a long but productive day for the Northern Alliance. While not known at the time, the post-war analysis shows that the battles of November 5th broke the back of the Taliban defenses. For several days, General Dostum pursues the remaining Taliban forces along the Daria Suf Canyon through the Balkh Valley toward the narrow, heavily mined Tiangi Gap. On November 8th, the Taliban dig in on the back side of the gap and initially turn back Northern Alliance troops who were attempting to follow them through the pass. Tiger II establishes his position with a clear view of the Taliban defenses and calls in the full range of available air support. Relentless air attacks pound the Taliban resistance. However, the Taliban counterattack with several multiple rocket strikes into the pass and adjacent hills. This has become a decisive moment. Tiger II takes the initiative and slowly enters the pass on horseback, where Dostum's troops rally behind him. As they move towards the northern opening of the pass, the horsemen charge past him and attack. The combination of Northern Alliance cavalry and coalition air power forced the Taliban to flee. The next day, General Dostum's and General Atta's forces liberate Mazari Sharif. Mazari Sharif was an important fight for us because it was the fight that opened the land bridge to Central Asia to the north and uh, provided the first glimmer of hope to uh, not, not only the Northern Alliance but to a great many people in Afghanistan. It is the first major military victory of Operation Enduring Freedom, completed within three weeks of infiltration with fewer than 50 Americans on the ground. It is an operation like none before, with a combination of 21st century technology and age-old horse cavalry. The enemy is destroyed with little collateral damage, and significant humanitarian aid is delivered, even as the fighting is underway. This kind of operation just demanded joint concepts. I mean, every service was involved in some form or fashion, and we had to work together. Without a doubt, uh, the transformation in thinking uh, as to how we employ uh, our forces uh, was just as important uh, as any of the transformation in the technologies we used in this conflict. 
I, I would characterize OEF as a transformational battlefield. Fusing technology and fusing command and control and fusing information flow allowed for Mazari Sharif to fall as rapidly as it did and to be as decisive because you could then transfer that, uh, that ability, that technology and that capability uh, around through the country as we moved towards Kabul.